This is a Douglas DC-8. And so is this. But how is that possible? To find out, we're going to go back to the 1950s and look at the first jet airliner produced by the Douglas Aircraft Company in a special episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. I'd like to invite you to subscribe to the channel. If you enjoy the programs, please do hit the like button. It helps support the channel. We appreciate it. This airplane is the DC-8 Jetliner. This airplane is the DC-8 Skybus. What was that? Well, the Skybus was a 1946 proposal for a DC-3 replacement. The DC-3 at that time was 10 years old, and the Skybus was based on the unconventional configuration of the experimental XB-42 Mixmaster bomber that you see there at lower right. The DC-8 Skybus never got off the drawing board. But the airplanes that did created an entire family of Douglas Skyliners uh, at, seen here at Santa Monica from top the DC-3, DC-4, DC-6B, and DC-7. By the mid-1950s, more than half the airliners flying all over the world were built at Santa Monica by the Douglas Aircraft Company. But in Europe, the jet age had arrived. Starting in 1952 with the beautiful de Havilland Comet seen at top, the Vickers Viscount, first turboprop airliner, the elegant rear engine Sud Caravel, and the Soviet Tu 104. Back in the States, Douglas was seriously contemplating uh, converting the DC 7 to turboprop power, and this airplane would have been called the DC 7D. But that never came to pass. That, crowd, that crown went to Lockheed with their uh, Electra L188 seen here. Uh, America's first and only four-engine turboprop airliner. However, in June 1955, Douglas launched the DC-8 jet in the configuration that you see here. There was just two problems. First is that Boeing already had a jet airliner in the air, the 367-80 uh, prototype jet transport, as it was called. And this was the progenitor that was developed into the KC-135 tanker for the Air Force and the Boeing 707 airliner. Second issue was the plant itself at Santa Monica. Although it was quite adequate for producing uh, piston-powered airliners seen here, the runway was 5,000 feet long and jet airliners required almost twice that length and that uh, generation. So the answer was to move the entire operation to Long Beach Airport, which had been uh, the Air Force facility uh, building transports, and that runway was 10,000 feet long. Specific to the DC-8, two new, large, multi-million square foot uh, final assembly buildings were built on the east side of Lakewood Boulevard, across the street from the main uh, plant. Uh, these were buildings 80 and 84, ironically the only surviving structures of the plant to this day but these were built for the DC-8 production. And although National has the technical uh, distinction of being the first launch customer uh, to order the DC-8, longtime Douglas fans, uh, Pan American World Airways and their president Juan Tripp ordered 25 DC-8s and 20 Boeing 707s. United Airlines also ordered a, a fair number of airplanes. Here we see United President Pat Patterson with Mr. Douglas making the announcement. And Eastern's Eddie Rickenbacker ordered DC-8s as well, along with a number of European airlines. By this time, the DC-8 design was frozen into the configuration you see here in this beautiful painting by R.G. Smith. And although there was no uh, pr prototype aircraft per se, uh, production began with Ship 1 and Ship 2, the nose sections uh, seen here in Building 84. The wing assembly was uh, next door in Building 80. And uh, what you see here is called the wing box. This is the uh, three uh, spar assemblies and the fuel tanks and uh, fitted to the front and back of this uh, assembly would be the leading and trailing edge control devices. Well, the wing box was moved as you see here from building 80 into building 84 mated with the 19,000 pound fuselage assembly. And on April 9th, 1958, the first DC-8 rolled out into the Southern California sunshine. This photo was taken from the uh, Douglas Bell 47 photocopter looking down on the ramp. And here we can see that aircraft above uh, in this photo of uh, Mr. Douglas uh, smiling and waving down from the cockpit. Uh, 
Douglas Sr. was in the left seat. Douglas Jr. was in the right seat as the airplane was rolled out of the hangar. Here we see another copter photo looking down on the ramp with the uh, uh, predecessors of the DC-8 lined up behind from left to DC-3, DC-4, uh, C-118, which is the military version of the DC-6, and the United DC-7. You can see quite a difference in size from these airplanes to the new DC-8. Trademark of the DC-8 was the what they call the chin air intakes. This is for the air conditioning packs and cabin air. Uh, and uh, the engines that you see there also with the early configuration noise suppressors. By April of 1959, uh, the DC-8 was kind of making a splash in the media. Here we see a cover of Popular Science magazine illustrated by the great Bob McCall. And here he's showing a cutaway. This is a fold out of the entire airplane. But here we see the nose section with this cavernous cockpit Looks more like an Airbus A380, uh, but it uh, gave the impression of a luxurious new jet airliner with lots of room. And that's what, uh, that's what the public was clamoring for at the beginning of the jet age. But let's compare the cockpit. Here's a Douglas DC-7, a captain's position in the center of the photo, radio rack on the left. Compare that to the DC-8 cockpit, living room comfort. You see here uh, seats for the co uh, captain, co-pilot, flight engineer, and on overwater uh, routes, they, they carried a navigator as well, but a very modern cockpit of the future for 1959. The first airplane uh, conducted low, medium, and high-speed taxi tests up and down runway uh, 30 at Long Beach. And you see the plant there in the background with the Air Force transports. And on uh, May 30th, 1958, a proud day for the company, the first DC-8 took to the air. Here we see another view as it departs runway 30 at Long Beach on its maiden flight. And Douglas was in the jet age. Here we see a beautiful low sun uh, study of the airplane in flight, very elegant lines. Uh, wing sweep was 30 degrees compared to Boeing's uh, 35 degrees on the 707, but a very elegant looking airplane. And again, with an airplane in the air, Douglas could use photos of it in ads, uh, touting the world's most advanced jetliner, as we see here. Here's a picture of uh, ship two up at Edwards Air Force Base where the bulk of the flight testing was conducted. And the red uh, devices you see on the leading edges of the wing engine and uh, tailplanes uh, simulated icing. This is a wood structure that was used uh, for testing the icing characteristics of the wing and tail. Now you saw that uh, beautiful pristine uh, ship one rolling out of the hangar on the rollout day. Uh, this is what the airplanes look like uh, coming out in production. And these were getting ready to be towed across the street for uh, final outfitting, which we'll see in a moment. The flight test airplanes uh, could be distinguished by the uh, blocked windows that you see mid fuselage. This is where the test equipment was located and the data booms that you see on the wingtip. And again, there was a lot of PR in expectation of the new jets entering service. United actually had something called a Jetorama, which was a beautiful display that traveled around the country to major airports, giving people a look at the interior of the airplane. And uh, it was an exciting time, the beginning of the jet age. And of course, Ravel had to be the first to market a, a model kit of the DC-8. And so this was uh, released oh, well before the airplane went into service. But wait a minute, this view looks kind of familiar. Where have I seen this before? Oh. Could it be the rollout photo? Well, if you, if you crop it like so and do a little tweak to the uh, wings and engines, oh my gosh, dead ringer. We have the source material for the Ravel cover and that's why it's fitted with the prototype engines with the early uh, pylons and thrust reversers. Mystery solved. First delivery of a uh, DC-8 was to United Airlines on June 3rd, 1959. Here we see uh, United President Pat Patterson at the podium, Mr. Douglas seated on the right. Uh, this is a staged promotional photo with Douglas employees and uh, showing the first class boarding. Uh, the, uh, what you see in the foreground is a tow tug with the baggage containers. And this was uh, pretty advanced in those days rather than having the baggage hand loaded uh, piece by piece or up a conveyor belt. Uh, the bags were put into these containers, which were then lifted into the lower fuselage of the airplane. This is the west ramp for final outfitting. As I mentioned, the airplanes were towed across Lakewood Boulevard in the middle of the night and brought over to this uh, location uh, where they became ready for their first flights. 
I love this photo. This is uh, looking at the west ramp from the parking lot. Uh, that's a 1955 Lincoln Capri two-door coupe on the right. And uh, believe it or not, this is the parking lot that I parked uh, when I worked at the company. Gate 6 is uh, about 50 yards to our right. And Building 2, which is where I worked in the presentations department, uh, was uh, just out of frame. And so this is a very uh, meaningful uh, photo to me personally. But uh, a nice uh, study of the airplanes. You can see that the interiors have not been put in yet. And these are uh, getting ready for their initial flight testing. Here's the tail of the airplane, and you see the new blast fence that was constructed uh, to contain the jet blast when these airplanes uh, uh, started up and taxied out for their test flights. So the first production airplane uh, to be certified was called the DC-8 Series 11, and here we see uh, an 11 in the Delta Airlines markings, quite uh, elegant for that time period. And let's talk about this airplane for a moment. The Series 11 uh, DC-8 was 146 feet long, had a wingspan of 142 feet carried 116 passengers and had a cruise speed of 590 miles per hour. The range was 3,900 miles with a max gross takeoff weight of 265,000 pounds. This airplane was powered by 12,500 pound thrust Pratt & Whitney JT-3C turbojets, the civilian version of the military J-57. And these were equipped with water injection. The Series 21 was the same airframe, but fitted with uh, more powerful 15,800 pound thrust Pratt & Whitney JT-4A turbojets, the military J-75. And this airplane had a range of 4,100 miles and in domestic use just offered higher performance uh, for takeoff, especially from hot high airports. Delta and United began scheduled service on September 18, 1959 with Delta getting the edge uh, because of the time zones uh, they were flying on the East Coast and United began in San Francisco. I should mention that the Eastern color scheme was very complex and over the first seven airplanes, it was simplified to what we see here. Uh, the title was simplified to fly Eastern eventually. And this became uh, kind of the standard uh, DC-8 color scheme up until the advent of the Whisper Jet hockey stick, which we'll see at the end of the program. But looking at the Eastern airplane, let's talk about the engines. You see here in flight, the thrust reversers and the new pylon design. And the reason for this was uh, what you see here. Uh, in the extended position are what were called ejector rings. And this was the uh, shroud at the tail end of the nacelle, which was uh, moved aft on a track uh, on the bottom of the pylon. And this served a number of different functions. Number one, it reduced the noise by 10%. Number two, it served as the thrust reverser. There were buckets on either side of the ring which uh, deployed and then uh, created the thrust reversers. And third, it could be deployed in flight uh, and used as a speed brake to keep the speed down uh, during high speed descents. By now production was underway and here we see a number of DC-8s out on the east ramp. These airplanes are undergoing initial mods to the uh, original wing design. But this is a very prophetic photo because it shows uh, the DC-8 uh, and Pan Am markings uh, ramping up production with the uh, C-133 Cargo Master uh, transport at top, which was winding down. The Pan Am DC-8 was called the Series 30. And this was uh, essentially a 21 airframe, but with uprated engines and additional fuel capacity and a higher gross takeoff weight, which gave the airplane a range of 4,800 miles. Series 30s were ordered by Pan American Grace or Panagra uh, for the Pacific JAL, Japan Airlines, and a number of European carriers, including the KSSU Group, that stood for KLM, SAS, Swiss Air, and French UTA Airlines. Here we see a beautiful photo of a SAS Series 30 uh, in flight over the uh, coast of Huntington Beach. And if you look at the forward fuselage, you see two separate windows just after the cockpit or forward of the R1 door and uh, in the head of the SAS stylized dragon. And that was a first class compartment that you see here, nice wide first class seats. The main cabin was divided into uh, a business class section with three and two seating in the foreground. And then in the back of the photo there, you see the main uh, economy cabin with three and three seating, which was standard for most of the coach seating in the DC-8. The Series 40, uh, was a Series 30 intercontinental airframe, but powered by 17,500 pound thrust Rolls-Royce Conway 509 bypass 
turbofans, the first iteration of the fan engine. If you're wondering what an F-104 is doing flying off the right wing, this airplane uh, was used in flight testing at Edwards and on August 21st, 1961, diving down from 53,000 feet, the airplane reached a speed of Mach 1.012 at 41,000 feet, calibrated on the ground, and technically became the first commercial airliner to reach Mach 1. The next step for the DC-8 was fan engines. And here we see a test airplane. The whole purpose of the fan jet was that the larger fan section in front would produce a shroud of cool air that would surround the hot core exhaust, reducing noise. It would produce more thrust. It was uh, more fuel efficient. Overall, just a much, uh, much higher thrust, more efficient engine. The first production fan jet was the Series 50. Here we see your Series 55 in Air New Zealand markings landing on runway 30. Beautiful photo and a beautiful color scheme for the airplane. The Series 50 was then evolved into what was called the Jet Trader. This was a combination freight and passenger airplane. Freight could be loaded through the front uh, cargo door into the forward fuselage, and passengers could board in the aft cabin, as you see here. More than 200 Jet Traders were built. There was one military variant of the DC-8. It was uh, built for the US Navy. It was called the EC-24A, and it served as a trainer for electronic warfare uh, flight officers who would then fly uh, uh, ECM missions in carrier-based and land-based airplanes. The next step, stretching the airplane. This was built into the original design with a tall main landing gear to allow fuselage clearance on takeoff and landing. And so uh, by adding a 37-foot uh, stretch to the fuselage, uh, they created the beginning of the Super 60s series. First flight of the uh, Super 61 was on March 4th, 1966. And uh, the fuselage length was 183 feet. The airplane carried up to 220 passengers. And what we see here in this uh, beautifully retouched photo, or I should say restored photograph, is the uh, Douglas Chief Executive Team about to board the 61 for a world demonstration flight. From left, we see Jackson McGowan, at that time Vice President of Douglas Aircraft, uh, Donald, w Donald W. Douglas Jr., President of Douglas, and on the right, John Lundelius, Vice President, Douglas Flight Test. The 61 was a beautiful airplane uh, with the longer fuselage. It really changed the economics of air travel around the world. And here we see it in JAL markings. But there was another step in the progress of the airplane, and that was to redesign the nacelle and pylon for more efficient uh, drag-reduced performance. This was called the flow-through nacelle and the cutback pylon. And this is what it looked like from inside the airplane. The purpose was to reduce drag by 5%. And uh, this is now the 19,000 pound thrust Pratt & Whitney JT3D-7 turbofan. Uh, and the Series 62 seen here carried 189 passengers and had a range of nearly 6,000 miles. The first really dedicated long range airplane. Fuselage was seven feet longer than a Series 30. And United Airlines used this airplane to fly from New York nonstop to Honolulu, Hawaii. The interiors were upgraded in the 1980s. Here's a Braniff DC-862. You can see the beautiful leather upholstery on the uh, seat and the beginnings of the overhead storage. These are early small size overhead storage lockers, nothing like the uh, overhead bins we see in today's airplanes, but it was the beginning of that uh, configuration. Now, if you take the uh, wing and engines of a 62, and I should mention the wings were extended three feet at the tip uh, to uh, aid the aerodynamics. If you take the wing and engines of a 62 and mate it with the 183-foot uh, fuselage of the 61, you've got a DC-863. And this was referred to as the ultimate DC-8. Carried up to 250 passengers in high-density seating for military airlift command charters or MAC charters. And I flew a number of these when I was in the Air Force in the late 1960s. And I have to tell you, it was a fabulous airplane. Had a range of 4,000 miles and a gross takeoff weight of 355,000 pounds, almost 100,000 pounds more than the original DC-8 that was first rolled out. The 63 made a uh, tremendous uh, freight airplane equipped with a freight door in the forward fuselage. And it was used by Flying Tigers 
Seaboard World and a number of other freight airplanes, also in the convertible freighter configuration. And the final original uh, Series 63 airplane built at Long Beach was the 63 PF. This was an unusual hybrid airplane that contained the uh, heavy cargo floor and uh, stronger landing gear and higher gross weight of the freighters, but it did not have a cargo door. And so uh, it was a high performance airplane used by Eastern and a number of other carriers. And here we see the Eastern hockey stick whisper jet era uh, color scheme, which was just tailor made for this airplane, really, really gorgeous. The final chapter in the saga of the DC-8 was the Series 70. This is re-engined with SNECMA CFM 56 high bypass ratio turbofans derated to 22,000 pounds of thrust. But I gotta tell you, this airplane was a hot rod with that much power. It was a conversion of the Series 61, two and three aircraft by a company called Camacorp, founded by a former president of Douglas, Jack McGowan. The pylons and the cells were built by Grumman, and these aircraft were converted at Douglas's Tulsa, Oklahoma facility. The 71 and 73 airplanes carried up to 240 passengers or freight, had a range of 4,500 miles. A total of 110 Series 70s were built for 19 airlines and private users. Here we see a 63F, I'm sorry, a 73F in Tiger's markings. Uh, undergoing stall recovery tests high over the Mojave Desert. It's an attitude you don't normally see, but this was part of the flight test regime uh, in certifying the new airplane. And flying today is a Series 72 uh, used by NASA and based in Palmdale, California. It's a flying aero laboratory used for atmospheric and oceanic testing and surveys. It's a very valuable, very useful airplane and a good example of the DC-8's 80,000 hour service life and uh, the fact that this airplane is still serving operationally today. So as the DC-8s fly into the sunset of history, uh, we see that there were 556 built total between the years 1958 and 1972. And this is uh, again, revisiting that ramp photo, but let's take a look. You have the DC-3, which was built in 1935, next to the DC-8, which first flew in 1958. And along with the DC-4, 6, and 7, these airplanes are still flying today. Uh, the DC-3 and 6 and 8 are still in operational service, uh, making uh, revenue for their owners and operators, and a real testament to the company and the longevity of the airplanes, and an amazing chapter in aviation history. So there you have it, the story of the DC-8 jetliner, and the uh, Douglas Aircraft Company entering the jet age. Special thanks to the great folks who uh, allowed us to bring you uh, this presentation to you with the imagery and history, and we appreciate their support. Thank you for celebrating aviation with Mike Machat. We certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. And until next time, take care.